screen here for you. So the next guy who got uh, nominated was me by a, a, a quick hook and and uh, from Bill Douglas here, and it reminded me so much of working with Bruce Kirkwood. But uh, he hooked me into finding some speakers, and uh, I found some speakers right away. I knew one guy that I've been working for many years as a camper, and uh, when we bought some property on Aspen Lake, uh, Barney Bark Homestead, uh, which was our planned retirement home, um, this man opened up a lot of stories. A lot of neat stories. And I also knew another man who's coming in a couple months who also had a lot of stories and they ended up intertwined. So when Bill offered me this position, it's like, I couldn't wait. So I want to introduce with great honors Roy Hamlin uh, for a speaker. And um, Roy, please come on up and give us your spiel. I have a script, <laughs> and I don't know if I can stick to it or not, but I'll try. And I have a whole bunch of my family here, and I'll take time to introduce them in a minute. Uh, but before we begin, I have to take uh, a little pause as a former uh, principal of a Catholic school and say a little prayer. Mm -hmm. You'd be kind enough to just follow along. I do have to use glasses. I wrote this a couple of days ago, just off the top of my head, I thought, you know, we're up in God's country here. Let's see, let's think about this. So here we go. Dear God, as residents of or visitors of the Gunflint Trail, give us the strength and foresight to protect this awesome wonder you have created for us. Instill in us the courage and the foresight to make a difference when the need arises. Help us help others who have experienced extreme difficulties from natural or other disasters. Thank you for the opportunity to be on the Gunflint Trail. Amen. Uh, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All creatures great and small. Did anybody see that on public TV? Anybody here? Yeah. It was on uh, for about six, eight weeks. And I thought, you know, I could start this program with uh, with a moose or something big or whatever, but a chipmunk. Why a chipmunk? Because that was one of my favorite creatures when I came here. His name is Stubby. And the reason he was called Stubby is he had no tail. And as I was camping in the campgrounds, uh, Stubby would beg. He loved to beg. So I thought, well, let's do something with seeds and see what he does. Well, Stubby became a friend of everybody around us. And uh, I had friends from Missouri, who I'll talk about a little bit later, who just loved Stubby because I wasn't here all the time, but they were here all summer. And uh, they could get that animal to climb on the shoulder, stand on their head, whatever. And it just reminds us that um, it, it's not necessarily the, the big animal that makes a difference in your life. Sometimes it's a small one. With that, try the next picture. All right. Uh, this is my family. This is it. And uh, my wife sitting next to me there is Jan. She's back in the back. And uh, we've been married 61 years. And I, I think that this just says pretty much how committed we are to each other. And then the rest uh, include uh, uh, the people that are here today is Renee, our daughter, Robert, uh, her husband, uh, a new graduate from high school, Roman. And then we have, uh, let's see, who else is here? Uh, 
Jonah isn't in this picture. Yes, he is. There he is. And Jonah is here today. And Rochelle is here today. Uh, I, I thank them for taking the time to come. And hopefully I can do justice to whatever. Um, with that, I want to thank Bonnie Schutte for inviting me and being kind enough to get my pictures in order. And hopefully they'll stay that way. <laughs> And Dan Bauman and the Bauman family who have treated me so well as a camper, because once Barney Barrett, my uncle passed away, things changed for me. I no longer had a place to go. I had to have a, a camper or a campsite. And they were kind enough to treat me well over all these years. Um, the question is, who am I? Well, my name's Roy Hamlin. I was born and raised in Duluth, Minnesota. And um, I, I'm 83 years old. And I absolutely hope I'm around for a long time to come because I love it up here. I just love it up here. Um, I was an educator for 37 years, 29 as a principal, 13 of those in a Catholic school, the rest in a public school. And I spent my winters Whenever I could get up here, I would come in the winter, whenever I could come in the spring, and certainly in the summer. Uh, so I've been up here 73 consecutive years, and I think I've seen and enjoyed about everything conceivable. And it's the people that make the difference. You know, we have this wonderful environment, the lakes, the rivers, and, and the, the, the flowers, and the, the trees, and whatever. But it's really the people that make the difference. Because if it was just trees, rivers, and lakes, there wouldn't be any stories to tell. But we have stories. All of us have stories. And I, hopefully, I can tell you a few today. I'm going to be talking about my Uncle Barney later in the program. And um, after four hours, if you want to choose to get up and leave, <laughs> you feel free to do that. <laughs> And I have some items for viewing over here, and I'll, I'll introduce them to you. So if you want to come up and take a look after, you're welcome to do that. And I will end the program with a bit of music. <laughs> uh, my daughter, excuse me, I have to. One of my daughters is a owner of a music store in Duluth. She isn't here today, um, and she's actually teaching. So. Uh, I'd like to say hi to her, but she doesn't have time to be on the Zoom. So with that, this is my mom and dad. And in 1949, we climbed in the car and came up to Aspen Lake. I was 10 years old, and I didn't know what it was in for. And it was an old car. My dad bought it in 1942. So you can imagine what we were dealing with. And when we got to the Gunfield Trail, uh, it isn't what it is today, I can tell you that much. Uh, and we found our way up. That's my Uncle Barney and my Aunt Billy. Billy was my dad's sister. So that's how I had the connection of coming here. And uh, they had arrived up here from Chicago somewhere between 1943 in 1945. I don't know exactly when. They stayed in one of the cabins uh, that Aspen Annie had in the wintertime. And then the, the fall and spring and summer, they built their own cabin, which we'll uh, see in a bit. And they, uh, they were the ones that invited us up here. And my mom and dad had never been on a vacation before. They both were factory workers in Duluth, and uh, I'm their only child, and they decided, let's go up north. So we did. And with that, um, that's the first phase of what I'm talking about today. The second phase goes from the time, um, let's see, from 1950, Sick. It was from 1949 to 1959 was phase one of my experience up here. Phase two 
was from the time I, I got married until Barney died in 1987. And from that point on is phase three, and here I am. And th that's kind of how this, this story goes. Um, I'd like to start with, try another picture, see what we get. Okay, that is uh, Aspen Lake looking out the window uh, of the cabin of Al Fleeter and Al is here somewhere, where are you at? Back there. He and I have become close friends and I have breakfast with him as often as we can. We look out the window and there's this lovely little lake, Aspen Lake. Um, try another picture, see what we get. Okay, <laughs> Gerald Thilmany lives on Loon Lake. He had a cabin there, he's had a cabin there for many, many years. He plays the accordion. You may know who he is. His picture is in the uh, on the wall at Chippewa Museum. He donates his time and energy for this community in many, many ways that most people don't even know. And uh, he's a, I grew up with him uh, near Proctor, Minnesota, just uh, part of Duluth. And uh, with him, he uh, taught me a lot of things. He invited me to go into the Boundary Waters canoe area. And I was uh, teaching school at the time. And I really didn't know much about the Boundary Waters canoe area. And so he said, well, come on with a bunch of guys. We're going to go up and do this. He took us to a place called Gillis Lake. Anybody here ever been there? Nobody? Yeah. Oh, OK. All right. All right. My favorite lake in the world. If I ever had another opportunity and somebody could carry me in there, <laughs> uh, literally, I would I would go. Um, it is absolutely the most pristine, beautiful lake you'll ever want to see. It has a cliff at the end of the lake where people go all that way just to jump off. They don't fish. They, do, they <laughs> find a campsite and they spend their time jumping off this cliff. And it's uh, about 50 feet straight down. So they aren't going to hit their heads or anything like that. But anyway, he taught me all those things. And um, if you want to catch fish, that's the place to go. Uh, it, it also is one of the most serene, calm places to be, even though there are campers there. Um, most of the campsites are all up on a rock outcropping overlooking the lake. It's gorgeous. If you have a chance to get there, however you can get there, I would encourage it. Okay, next one. Okay, <laughs> don't ever judge a book by its cover. Uh, and I, I sincerely mean that. Fred and Virginia Thompson, Springfield, Missouri. I didn't know them. I was out on uh, the lake in a canoe at um, Flower Lake. And I was, had done some early fishing in the morning and I started headed toward the uh, landing and up comes this beautiful truck with a beautiful, pristine, blue, bright blue canoe. And so I thought, well, they're going to, they're going to get ready to put the boat in. So I'll just wait and we'll let them do that. <clears throat> in the process, they got out, and I thought, uh-oh, uh, husband and wife, white hats. Both of them had white hats. Both of them had yellow life preservers. Both of them had white boots. And I said to myself, what do we have here? <laughs> and they took that canoe, carefully walked it to the water, went in the water, and set it in the water. Make a long story short, I spent 20 years with them. Went down to, to Springfield, Missouri, to their home on at least 10 occasions to learn a little bit about the South. They taught me life. Uh, she is now, he passed on about eight years ago, and she's in her nursing home today. We went down to visit her a few weeks ago, we got to visit with her for an hour. It was the best hour. Okay, try another one. See what we get. Okay. <laughs> huh. Yeah. Um, 
Mr. Nelson, Gene Nelson, he lived next to us on the Lake Road in Hermantown. Gene is one of those people who, uh, um, if, if you're driving down the road and you come to a Y in the road, take it. <laughs> All right, that's what he does. And you never know what he's going to do. He is one of the most inspirational people I've ever known. He can fix anything. He's like Leroy Lilienthal, for those of you who may not have known Leroy. He could fix anything, anywhere, anytime. And there's one more person in this audience sitting right back there, uh, Gordy Loxo from, he's now, he was from Superior, he's now from near Hudson, Wisconsin. It came up for this. Anyway, those people could fix anything. And I could tell you stories to go on forever, but, this, the one thing he couldn't do was count how many holes he had in the ice. <laughs> yeah, right. Loon Lake, I'll just tell this one story because it happened all over. We have financed a probably a part of the uh, county courthouse down here. Um, <laughs> literal. Um, we were in, on Loon Lake fishing. We had eight guys. Two of us decided to stay, he and I, and I was going to cook lunch and all the rest of the guys took off in their snowmobiles and there were like eight or nine holes open. I'm cooking, I'm not paying attention to this guy. What does he do? He puts a minnow on hooks in every one of those holes. Around the corner come two snowmobiles going on lickety split. And they come roaring up to us and hopped off and said, don't touch a thing. Well, long story short, it cost us 163 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, we, there's more to the story, but without getting belaboring it, um, I, I asked him, what were you thinking? He said, well, if there's a hole, put something in it. <laughs> you know. Well, anyway. Uh, he was one of those great people. Uh, try another picture. Ron and Mary Sternal. They live in the cities. Ron has been one of my closest friends all my life, especially uh, beginning in high school. We introduced them 60 years ago. And uh, they're still living in the cities. He uh, recently had a health issue. Otherwise, he would be here tonight. I don't know if he's on Zoom or not. His name was up there. I don't know if he is on there or not, but um, he was, uh, oh, he donated to the museum up here. Remember the uh, commercial with the beer, Ham's mm -hmm. Beer commercial and the bear? He worked for Ham's Brewery for many years. And then uh, when they sold out the straws and whatever else he left, of course, but he was one that saved things, and he still does that. But he saved a bunch of cups with the pictures of the bear and the guy that took uh, took that commercial, and he donated to the museum, and it's on, in, in the museum today. So he does care about this place, and I hope you're listening. Uh, okay, next picture. <laughs> All right. All right. This guy right here, his name is Jeff Giansanti. And Jeff owned the elbow room in Superior. And I don't know if any of you knew of that, but it was a pizza place, Sammy's Pizza Place is what it was, but he also sold uh, Italian restaurant kinds of uh, meals. Well, if you ever enjoyed shrimp scampi on the ice, that's the guy to bring with you. And we, he would come up here and he'd have pots and pans hanging from the trees and he'd be cooking while we're, we're, we're fishing. And we ate in luxury because of him, but a great man. And um, he sold his business and no longer uh, doing that anymore. Next one. Okay, you're gonna see some pictures of moose here. We've all seen moose. Um, my friend, Ron Sterner, who you'd seen earlier, he was the one that had a camera. I don't carry a camera. My camera's right here. And he 
took, he always had a camera with him and took pictures. So uh, go through a few, okay? There's about five or six of them. Oh, and over to the bears. We all remember the bears? Yes, sir. Yeah, the, the, uh, the dump site on a Clearwater Road. And I think there was a dump site up here they did that too, didn't, didn't there? That had bears? Yeah, I, I heard about that. Anyway, that was, uh, that was interesting. Keep going, there's a couple more. And you know, the people were stupid. I mean, <laughs> stupid. They would gather and throw food down to the bears and the bears would crawl up within feet of these people. And you know, a bear is unpredictable, let's face it. And thank goodness they closed it and buried it all and the bears aren't there anymore, but they're, they do come to our campground once in a while. Um, <clears throat> okay. This guy is also from Superior, Wisconsin. And I wanna point out the bird. You, know, you think of all of the all of the animals we have up here, and the birds, and we have a lot of birders that come up here. I don't know if you know that or not, and, but they will come in a bus, and they park the bus, and they stand in the middle of the road, and they look at birds, and they don't care if you're coming in a car or not. They they aren't moving, <laughs> so you have to honk on the horn and whatever else to get them to move. But um, it just uh, that happens to be a the Canadian Blue Jay or Whiskey Jack, what they call them. I, I don't know if there's another name for them or not, but um, that's what they have. Next. Oh, oh. Um, <laughs> one of my campsites after Barney passed away, I had to have something. So I started with tents. And that tent and that little shower, I went fishing in the morning with, uh, with Fred. And um, Virginia stayed in, the, in their big uh, motor home. And that's what I was saying. When I came back, it was completely shredded, just completely shredded, both, both of them. There was no food in there, but it stripped it completely apart. It was, it was hard to tell it was a tent. So I went next door and I said to Virginia, did you happen to see what an animal over here? And she said, well, there was one that landed on the screen door here. And I said, well, what did it look like? So she got out her book and showed what it looked like. I said, well, uh, it's gotta be a pine mark. Well, apparently that's what it was. And uh, that's an animal you don't wanna mess with. But anyway, next, ah. Oh. My favorite boat. And I know my Jan is saying, don't show that. Don't <laughs> show that. Uh, <laughs> I bought the boat uh, long before I started uh, fishing after Barney passed away. And I painted it the color of Proctor Schools because I was a principal in Proctor Schools for a few years. So I thought, well, green and gold, that's a good color. And uh, of course, it, it chipped and whatever else and looked like heck. So I uh, had, had it for many, many years and decided, well, um, maybe it's time to sell. So next picture. So I fixed it up. <laughs> you know what I got for that? hundred bucks. That's all I could get for that. All that work, I put a new transom on the back, I painted it, I went through everything to make that thing look nice. And I got a hundred bucks. Bang. Next, here we go. This just happens to be some scenery. Uh, I think I think that's oh, honeymoon club. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, my wife and uh, Mary Sterl. Next. That's just a scenic picture. And uh, I think maybe what we'll do is go through some of those right now. Um, when you're in a storm and you have canoes, pull over. Yeah. Our favorite bird, obviously, and they're so friendly. This was my first camper that I bought. It was a Toyota with a camper on the back, and I really enjoyed that. We had a good time with it. And it, whoops, back up. Yeah, this is what I have now. 
I'm in Site 35 in the Flower Lake Campground. Uh, thanks to the Bowmans, they know exactly where I should be. <laughs> and uh, um, anyhow, that that picture was taken at the time I had my old boat, and uh, it's one of the nicest things I've ever had. Um, it protects you from the rain, and we had plenty of that overnight. And uh, it, it's just a, a neat vehicle, and you see a lot of them on the road now. They're made in Bacchus, Minnesota. And Bacchus, Minnesota is about 45 miles north of Brainerd. If you go straight up, that's where it is. And, um, oh, trees. Jan and I were at the campground one day, and I said, you know, we've got these great big trees down by the lake. Let's go measure them. So I want to see how big round they were. And um, so we took a tape measure and went down to the lake and there's two trees side by side. And if you stand at the bottom and look up, you can't see the top. So they're huge. And I said, let's see how, what the circumference is. One foot up, I, maybe it was three feet up. Three feet up, we took the circumference of one tree, it was 15 and a half feet. <laughs> and we went to the next one with 18 and a half feet. 18 and a half feet around. How many years has that thing been there? We don't know. We probably won't know until they cut it down, I suppose, or it falls down. But um, anyway, there's beautiful trees up here, and uh, I hope we can respect them. Next. Uh, anybody know where that is? Nobody? Uh, I'll give you a clue. It's not on the Gunfield Trail. <laughs> Okay, this is Partridge Falls. Now, if you go toward the casino on Highway 61, the old Highway 61 breaks off and goes up into the woods. And you follow that and you will come to a little road and a sign that says Partridge Falls this way. And you drive in there and it's about a four mile trek and there's boulders and there's all sorts of stuff to get on, but you can get there. I wouldn't go there now, but you know, because of the water and everything. But prior to that, you could drive in. And what you do is you, you end up at the top of the falls, but uh, you can climb down the side and get right in front of it. And it is absolutely awesome. The sound, the noise, and the, the um, river that goes down has two big cliffs that the river goes through. And it's just <clears throat> absolutely striking. Let's keep going. I think we got a few of them here. Yeah, there's another one. Um, I want to say Aspen Lake. Oh, this, uh, you people will probably know more about this than I do, but I think that was after the windfall. Uh, we couldn't see. Uh, into the woods until the windfall came and all of a sudden you could see things you couldn't see before and th that river i think is down here somewhere and th this is all blow down stuff here keep going there you go yeah that's birch lake and uh at the time this happened i was home in duluth and I was working part-time for the company that had taken over, you would know that, Dan, the company that took over the campgrounds for five years. They're from Arizona or something. Anyway, um, they, whoops, how did we get there? Back up one. Anyway, they, um, I was working at the campgrounds as a, as a helper for this company. And then they wanted me to help with chainsaws and everything else to get rid of the things. I said, no, 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 I'm not doing that. I was hired to go uh, for three campgrounds to collect the money, clean the bathrooms, and, and make sure the campsites were taken care of. I said, I'm not a lumberjack. So uh, we parted ways. Anyway, next. Winter time, absolutely. You all know that if you've been up here. Uh, just a gorgeous, gorgeous place to be. 
and uh, my wife and two daughters, Leanne and Renee. And then we had uh, people that stayed at um, Gunflint Lodge for about seven, eight years. We came up for a four day weekend. And um, we, that was absolutely the most incredible time together with eight or 10 guys I've ever had in my life. And of course we had snowmobiles and we ice fish and so on. Next picture. Um, I took four priests up here while I was uh, principal at Cathedral. And this one is Father uh, John Garretts. He's now the uh, pastor in Hudson, Wisconsin. And we, and we were doing winter camping at, at, at um, Flower Lake Campground. Next. Now, and he was a good fisherman. He never, he never quit. He just would do that. Oh. It may not look like anything. See that nice little, little fish there? That is um, an eel pouch. Now, if you take an eel pouch that's frozen and you put it in a sink and then go back out fishing and you come back, chances are you're going to see something that'll open your eyes. Swimming in the sink. That thing was frozen, solid. We brought it to the cabin, put it there, had a bite to eat, and went back out fishing. And when we got back, that thing was swimming. Unbelievable. I hope we all have that kind of constitution, right? <laughs> uh, once in a while, you do get lucky. And I'm not the greatest fisherman in the world. In fact, I, I wish I was better at it. But every once in a while, you land one. And uh, that was, I don't know how, what the weight was. I was Father John Anderson and a good friend of mine. Uh, we had just come off Crocodile Lake. You know where that is? Okay. And, oh, you must have went backwards. Huh? There. And my wife, Jan, and we're cooking some uh, Cornish hens. Now, another thing about people. I've learned over the last several years it isn't so much what you're doing that counts, it's who shows up. This uh, black fellow drives into the campsite, campground at, at Flower Lake, and he had a little 14 foot boat behind him. And he said, uh, I, he looked kind of puzzled and I waved him down. I said, I, can I help you in any way? He said, yeah, he said, I, I just drove up here to see if uh, I could catch some fish. I said, where are you from? He said, New Jersey. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> New Jersey? He had driven nonstop all the way from some town in New Jersey to the Gunflint Trail because he had read online or a friend of him said, that's the place to go to catch fish. So he said, can you show me where to catch fish? Well, we did. <laughs> and come to find out, He's a multimillionaire. He is a, uh, a financial advisor for some organization and he's been investing all these years. He came three years in a row and I, I got to meet a, a friend from nowhere. So you never know what, what's going to happen in the people you're going to meet. And the other gentleman was, um, can you back up one? Yeah, Chuck Martin on the right there. He's from Superior. He's probably one of the best fishermen I know, I've known in my life, uh, other than Fred in Virginia. Fred is the best by far. He caught, I have to backtrack here, he caught walleyes on bear hooks. And I'm not kidding you, okay? <laughs> I, I saw it happen right before my eyes and I thought, that's not possible. <laughs> He made little lead head jigs with a little hook around it and he used it and he went down to the bottom and he jigged that thing. He'd catch five, six walleyes and I wouldn't have anything in the boat. And it's like, am I dumb or what? You know, but he, uh, anyway, this guy was similar in that respect. Next we go. Okay. We're going to talk about Barney. Barney Vera uh, came up here with his wife, and I think 
don't have a picture of her, do we? Try the next picture. No, that's just that. But his wife is right here, and I'll give you a chance later to come up and take a look at all this. And I want to go through this stuff in just a bit. Um, Barney uh, was a character. I mean, a real character. Uh, he came up here with his wife in the mid 40s and she divorced him in uh, around 1956. So then he had to take on life by himself. And he did it in a way that most people wouldn't even consider. Number one, he lived there for 45 years, no electricity, no running water, all right? Think of that, no running water, no electricity. And uh, one day he calls me up and he says, uh, are you gonna come up soon? I said, well, I'm thinking about it. And of course I come up every summer in the fall and whatever but he wanted me to come up right away. And I said, well, what, what's the problem? He said, I, I, I need kerosene. I said, kerosene? Yeah, I, give me 10 gallons of kerosene. He told me where to go in Duluth to get it. So I get my 10 gallons of kerosene and I drive up there. And they said, oh, he was so glad to see me. <clears throat> and uh, I said, what's the problem? He said, well, I had a little problem with the electric company. He said, um, they want to charge me $125 uh, fee for hooking up to, to the electricity. He said, I told him I'd pay, I'll pay for what I use, but I ain't paying a $125 fee. Well, he battled with him for about a month and a half to finally cut his electricity. So now he has no electricity. And I got up there with the 10 gallons and he hauls out 15 lanterns. You know what the, yeah. those lanterns look like, right? And he filled every one of them. Well, that, what did he do about running water? Thank God for uh, Flower Lake Campground, because they have one of the nicest water spigots you'll ever see. And what he did is in the fall, late fall, he had cartons, milk cartons that he'd saved because he drank a lot of milk. He saved those milk cartons and he filled them up and he lined his walls all the way around through the kitchen and the bedrooms whatever else and he had water all winter long he also uh collected things like um aluminum cans he had a bathroom or a two hole two holer in the woods and he would uh store aluminum cans in there he also had a separate uh i don't know if it was a little camper or what it was completely full of aluminum cans. And uh, how a person exists like this for 40 years is beyond me, but he did. But he also, he, he also helped other people. And he and Leroy Lilienthal, who lived, on, who lived on the hill, were very close friends. And if something needed fixing, they could fix it. And there were a lot of people, I think, that benefited from that. I'm not sure who they were, but I do know that the, he did, they did help people along the way. I don't want to lose track of where I am here. Okay. Mm -mm. I'm gonna take a minute to show you what I have up here and you people can uh, uh, come up and look at it later. I think it's, uh, I want to finish the Barney story too, but for now, these two instruments were used by my mother and dad when they came up to the Gunfoot Trail. Uh, does anybody know what they are? Tell if you know. Anybody know what they are? Yeah. I'll tell you later. <laughs> uh, he had a poem on his wall. <clears throat> And that was the only thing left. He passed away. They called me. I was a principal in Crosby, Ironton. And they said, you're the only person that we know that he knows. So could you come up and do his funeral? And I did. And that's a whole other story. 
But then uh, in the spring of the year, he died in February. In the spring of the year, they emptied out his house and some uh, auctioneer from Duluth took all his stuff to Duluth. And I got a phone call saying they were auctioning it off at five o'clock that mm -hmm. night. Uh, oh my God, I gotta get down there and get something. This was the only thing I was looking for. And I knew the auctioneer, nice man. I walked in and I said, this is my uncle's stuff. And I really, I need, I need to look for something and can I buy it for me? He said, if you find it, you can have it. Well, I went through a couple of boxes and lo and behold, there it is. And it's a, it's a poem and I have the poem here. And if you're interested in, uh, interested in the poem. I want to take time to read it because it really is it really is the gunflint trick. And I don't know where he got it, but it was on his wall and I knew I wanted it. It's called These Are the Things I Prize. And whole of dearest worth, light of the sapphire skies, peace of the silent hills, shelter of the forests, comfort of the grass. Music of birds, murmur of little rills, shadows of clouds that swiftly pass, and after showers, the smell of flowers, and the good brown earth, and best of all, along the way, friendship and mirth. That pretty well describes um, the Bethel Trail, as far as I'm concerned. I do have a picture of Barney and Billy that you can look at. I also have a picture here of Al Fleeter. And what kind of fish is that? Come on. Who said it? Crappie. It's a crappie. You know where it was caught? Aspen, Aspen Lake. <laughs> I fished Aspen Lake for 72 years. <laughs> never caught one of these. <laughs> and I was with him in the boat and he pulls this thing in and I said, where did you get that? And he says, down there. <laughs> and uh, he sent this as a calendar he sent to me. And I thought, you know, uh, think about it. All those years and I never caught a crappie of it. And uh, talking with Dan Bauman, he assures me that there are crappies in there. Sure, you, but nobody else. Barney <laughs> <laughs> uh, had a way of making money, and one of the ways of making money of all the all the water he collected that he didn't use, he froze, and this is what he found on his on his mailbox. <laughs> oh. Okay. You talk to people of that age and they'll say, oh, it's that ice guy. I remember that ice guy. And you, people would drive down into his place. In those days, there weren't very many people selling ice around here, but he was, and he was selling it for a buck a, buck a quart of, of frozen water. And uh, so I, I saved this after, uh, actually the Bahamans gave it to me. And uh, they had taken over the land and so on and so forth, but and asked if there's anything I wanted. And I saw this and I thought, mm -hmm. gotta have it. I hang this on my wall in the garage mm -hmm. so I have visual of him every day. Mm -hmm. uh, where do I go from here? We all know what this is, right? Mm -hmm. Diamond Willow. Forty locks over there made this. This is a dead diamond willow. If you cut one that's alive, it'll turn out white and have a different color to it. But Gordy made this for me, and I have it in my camper. And when I go for walks along around the campground, I have it with me every day. And uh, it's really, really pretty cool. And I've got the other one that Fred made for me, Thompson. And that one's about this tall, but it was made from fresh. Should we tell them where they got it? Okay. You sure? Okay. 
Uh, the diamond willow that we were able to get is down by <coughs> the bridge by Nor North Brule. If you go around the North Brule into the woods, you'll find a lot of this stuff. So if you want to try that out. <laughs> I have written my story of 73 years. It's over a hundred, oops, it's over a hundred pages with drawings and whatever. And I just chose to sit down at the computer and just go. I took no notes. I just, from right here, I sat down, I'm gonna type about this. And um, if you wanna look at it, you're welcome to look at it. If you want a copy, uh, you'll have to pay for the paper. <laughs> I call this at an auction, and I keep that in my in my den every day. It reminds me if I'm not there, this is. So, uh, <clears throat> no more fun. Uh, I know my wife does not like this hat <laughs> for a variety of reasons, but. It's warm in the winter and it has ear laps. <laughs> and I got it down in, the, in uh, Grand Marais. Uh, if you haven't read this book, read it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many of you have. Absolutely incredible. And uh, we're so fortunate to have people like Dan and others that make a difference here. Uh, let's see. I have uh, some poems here. Uh, that one over there I showed you, this one is called Not Alone. You're welcome to take copies. Um, well, I ran off 40, so there should be enough here for everybody. Um, this is there. Oh, there was a gentleman who lived up here called, his name was Cyril. I don't know how many of you knew of him. Okay. Uh, my favorite artist, Harold Stockman, over here, painted this. He lived in this hut for I don't know how many years. <laughs> and uh, in so doing, uh, he showed us how to live meagerly and be able to still have a sense of humor and love people. And uh, she, she painted this, and I said, Carol, I got to have gave that to me the other day. Mm -hmm. um, there also, she gave me some pictures which I will return to her right now of Cyril. And I'll leave them, I'll leave them up here. You guys can look at them, but they go back to her. He was a he was one of these people who did anything and everything to make a buck to be able to live here. And one of the things he did was peel logs. And this is one of the buildings he peeled. And that's amazing. I don't know. They paid him 75 cents an hour to do this. Mm -hmm. And he did anything he could to make a buck and be able to live here. Um, I think eventually he was taken by the uh, social services because his health was bad. I think I've covered about everything there. I do want to mention um, one more thing. And uh, Aspen Annie. Um, when I came up here in 1949, she owned Aspen Lake Lodge. And my mother and dad uh, loved fun. They loved to sing. And these instruments over here were the means by which they could do that. And when we came up here, um, the first thing my Aunt Billy said, we're going to the lodge. And the lodge was right next door. And they get over to the lodge and out come the libations and whatever else that she had available that wasn't supposed to be available. But yeah, that's what she did. And um, the singing and the dancing went on and on. And every, every summer when we came up here, that was the genre. We would go there and sing 
and dance and Aspen Annie would be part of the whole scheme. She loved it. And when she found out that Mars and Ham are coming up, <laughs> she would get a hold of her friends in Grand Marais and wherever else. We're going to have live music, folks. And they would show up. You go in that place and she had booths along the along the walls. And the booths and the chairs and everything are all filled up. And she was trying to serve chips and whatever else to make everybody happy. But uh, absolutely incredible. Now, um, I'm going to end this presentation with, uh, I, I can't play them because they are not tunable. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, this one here, these are called tipples, and they're 10 metal strings instead of four gut strings that you would see on a ukulele. This is the same size as a bass ukulele, except it has 10 metal strings that ring versus four gut strings that plunk. You get the difference? Okay. Um, they, these instruments right now are close to 100 years old. And my mom and dad started playing them uh, about 1930. I don't know where they got them, how long they had them, but I learned to sing with them. So with that, I, I will certainly answer your question, but I want to close by saying thank you for being here. <clears throat> and uh, this means a lot. Uh, is singing a song? Singing a song my parents sang. Uh, from someone like you, that's so good and true. I'd like to leave it all behind and go and find some place that's known. God alone, just a spot to call our own. As you travel in the, up north, Set our thing go forth and let the rest of the world go by. Ah, uh, any questions? Anybody? Okay. Tell us a little bit about Barney and. Uh... How much do you know about it? Well, here's what I I don't know a lot, but here's what I do know. He had pictures of himself in a suit with saddle shoes and the whole bit. This was before he was married. And I was told this. Okay. Um, and he had a job as a as a uh, machinist in Chicago during the war. And he couldn't be drafted because they needed machinists to make weapons and boats and ships and whatever else. And it seems odd to me that uh, in 1943, which was, the war wasn't over yet, that he and his wife chose to leave Chicago come to the very end of the North Woods. And uh, found, found out later that he wasn't the only one. There were quite a number of Chicago people who did this. Now, I didn't know who they were, but I did know that they, that was happening. Uh, I don't have any evidence other than that. Supposition, I guess, you know. Uh, You know, I, I don't know how well he knew Aspinani's husband, but of course Aspinani's husband left the scene mysteriously. 
So you kind of wonder about all that. Huh? No, he hasn't. No. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. The more important thing is how about the traffic. Oh, don't challenge me on that. <laughs> I was. <laughs> I don't know. Did you eat it? You did. Yeah. Yes, you did. Congratulations. You did. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, as long as I'm in the mood, um, uh, they used to sing songs uh, about things like. Uh, Beer, beer, glorious beer, <laughs> fills you right up to the ear. Drink down all of it, drink down a lot of it, drink down no bitter beer. Hi, Lee, hi, Lo, hi, Lee, hi, Lo, hello, lady, hello, lady, yo. Hi, Lee, hi, Lo, hi, Lee, hi, Lo, hello, lady, hello, lady. That's what they use. Every Friday night, they have people over singing and, and whatever. They worked hard, they played hard, and they knew they enjoyed life. And when I see the music that's going on today, I can cringe. You know, but uh, anyway, there's good music out there. The problem is, I just don't hear it. Okay. <laughs> um, there was one more song uh, Smile, oh, why? Do kiss me, Saturday. When the clouds roll by, I'll come to you. When the clouds are deep down in the lover's lane, my dearie, where the clouds will bring so merrily, everything can be a memory. The wind will play each one for you till we meet again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Everybody on Zoom, we're going to shut her down here. Sorry There's for the uh, phones yeah. up here. Yeah. Help yourself. If you were interested. So, uh, we can watch it later. And those who guessed to it, so we'll get a shot at it. Yeah, apologies to any real people that were cut out of the meeting, but uh, we had to lock it. Did I miss any pictures? I don't know how far I got. Uh,